It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon and a very close friend, Bill Taylor, President of the Economic Development Partnership of Alabama. Thank you, Claire, and um, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's uh, really coming back home, quite frankly, because um, I used to have a sailboat up here in, um, at Bayport, and I was over at Y Heritage, and I was in Penetangra scene also uh, over the years. So nice to be back, and um, must also add, I'm very impressed with the presentations this morning. Uh, you folks in such a short period of time have come such a long way. And, and that's really why I'm here. Um, the story goes like this. Several months ago, my secretary said, there's this guy on the phone, and I, I can't really understand him very well, but I think his name is Claire Boudreau or something. <laughs> I said, are you sure? And she said, yeah. And I said, I, I, I remember Claire. I mean, who could not remember Claire? And uh, so he got on the phone, and, uh, and he said, I said, how'd you track me down? And he tells me how he's... He did that, and then he says, what the heck, he didn't say heck, but are you doing in that role? And I said, well, you know, it's like herding cats. It's, it's a little bit like that, and uh, this economic development. But I have, had a little taste of it when I was at Mercedes, because after Mercedes came to Alabama, the traffic that we generated because of the global brand name and companies coming and saying, you know, why did you come to Alabama? What's it really like in Alabama? So governors would bring uh, board members and CEOs and chairman of boards to, to the Mercedes operation. And I would talk to them about our experiences in Alabama. And um, they would ask the governor and the economic development group to leave, and we'd have one-on-one -on -one discussions because they, they wanted to know quality, efficiency, what's it really like working with these folks down here? Do they wear, really wear shoes down here? And it's a really interesting questions, and it's a surprise. It was it always surprised me how long th that went on. That why are you here discussion? It, it went on for years and years and years, and arguably it still goes on today. You know, I, I, I note that because your existing businesses are so critical to your path forward, and you need to use them in every way you possibly can. So. And our, further to our discussion, I said to Claire, I said, you know, these cats are quite interesting to try to organize them. I'm, you know, my background, I'm anal like some other folks in here I met, or met earlier. Um, I like organization, I like structure, and uh, I like plans that are measurable, and I like accountability, and problems for me are opportunities. If you address them when they're this big, I used to say to my organization, any organization I've run, uh, give it to me when it's this big, it's an opportunity. When it's this big, it is a problem. So let's keep everything on the table and try to catch things as early as possible and, and find solutions. So um, making a difference. I mean, that's why you're here today, isn't it? To make a difference in your community. And that's really why I'm here. When I talk to Claire and then Sharon, Sharon, you really did the job. Um, I was really motivated to come up and talk to you folks and share some of my experiences. So with that... I'm going to talk about the um, Economic Development Partnership of Alabama, Mercedes-Benz, our approach to economic development in the state of Alabama, um, and I'm going to hopefully leave you with some thoughts, uh, because you reside here. You're the ones that have to pull the trigger. You're the ones that have to implement whatever plans you have and, um, and learn as you go. So, for me, there are some key factors associated with economic development and anything we do for that matter, whether that be my time at Mercedes or at Toyota at Ford. Leadership is absolutely a must-have. And that champion you talked about, for me, it's that maniac with a mission. You know, that's, that's the champion. Somebody who has that passion to drive things forward and, um, and understands the need for a team approach. Focus has been mentioned earlier. I have made people crazy in Alabama with this word, align, alignment, aligning resources. It's so, so important in a world that we live in where resources are like this. We just cannot afford to spread them any thinner. So aligning resources, learning by doing, 
implementation. And it's, a, it's a great model. And um, the courage is another component to implement, to think outside the box a little bit and ask that question, what if? So the Economic Development Partnership, can I just go back one slide, please? Uh, we were formed 25 years ago. Um, during my time at Mercedes, I, I had a seat on that board for about eight years. And um, we were set up by the private side and are totally funded by the private side. We're a statewide organization. But 25 years ago, business came to the table and they said, we need to be more active in economic development because the state's not performing as it should or could. So they created an organization and funded that organization to get to the table and help business understand why they need to come to Alabama. And the truth be known, if they weren't at the table back in 93 when we were doing the site selection, I doubt very much that Mercedes would have landed there. And I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that process in a moment. So our partners, really an interesting board. We have 27 board members, all CEOs of major corporations in the state of Alabama. And uh, so the des decision makers in the state, strongest board of any board across the state. And we meet on a quarterly basis and what they're interested in, quite frankly, are jobs and capital investment. They're business folks. So, so we're measured by our performance on creating good jobs, good paying jobs, and capital investment. So, what do we do? Well, we collaborate with the state, so we run in tandem with the state when it comes to overall economic development. I'll talk a little bit about that. Local, really engaged in local, communities like yours, regions like yours. Um, we support and participate in existing industry development, sustainability, and growth. 75% of our job growth in Alabama, year over year, comes from existing business and industry. In rural parts, and there are 67 counties in that state, arguably 45 are rural, but 100% of their job growth in most of those counties comes from their existing business and industry. And, um, and so <laughs> that's the, you cannot leave that topic out of your plan. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, we lead the state in uh, science and technology innovation, what we call renewal in our, in our statewide plan, which we develop for the state. And we market and promote the state in, in numerous different ways. We also house the database for the state for all the sites buildings of the state. And there are some 400 odd sites and some 400 odd buildings in the state available. Um, are, there's an argument on are they ready? And that's something that we work with communities on so that they can understand whether they're really in the game or not. So the Mercedes story, whoops. You know, Mercedes-Benz, back in, uh, let's go back to 91, 92, had a need to grow the company, the size of the company, build more cars. At that time, back in 93 even, the company built about 535,000 vehicles for a distribution of some 200 countries. Pretty small boutique company when it comes to automotive terms. So there was a need for the company to grow. And the growth really resided in the US. And the Japanese really had set the model of if you want to grow, you need to be present in the marketplace. They set that model way back when Toyota and Nissan and, and Honda and others came. So it started off with a nation across the whole US search, 150 odd different sites. And, um, and that's the way corporations think. And I just wanna walk you through this. And then, it, then we get into a region within the US and that was the Southeast. And as, we, as those states boil down in numbers, the, the bottom three, or the top three rather, the last three that we looked at or considered were North Carolina, South Carolina, and Alabama. So now we're collapsed down, now we're down looking at three states, and we say, okay, out of those three states, where do we best fit? And it is a fit, folks, across multiple topics. And um, Alabama was chosen. 
That's the state. It's a now site. So you move like that in, those deci in that decision making process. Think about that when, it when you're thinking about where you reside in the province of, of Ontario's plan, overall plan, and, um, and what they're bringing in and what fits into your communities too, is my, my message there. So, at the, but at the end of the day, when we got into that site within the state, who sold us, in fact, really you could argue back to the selection of the state, was uh, the local communities. The folks that we talked to, with the, because they have multiple, what they call mega sites that we would look at. But the community leaders, elected officials, business leaders, governor, all with the same message. And their message really was quite interesting. Your success will be our success. I don't think they understood that at the time. And I'll show you a picture of what has happened since. But, but they were committed. They had a passion. And they were going to stand by their word. So they were believable because when a corporation any size is looking, what you're trying to do is eliminate the risk factors. Can we be successful in that community? That's the question. Nobody is coming, I don't care how much money is on the table, if we went back to North Carolina or South Carolina and said, this is the number Alabama's offered, you know, give us something different, that was, we would never have gone back. It's not, it's not about dollars, dollars help aid when it comes to return on investment in a shorter time frame. So what was really interesting about Mercedes back then was that they wanted to do something different. The very, very traditional company invented the automobile and uh, is about 130 years old now today and, um, and a real traditional company. But when, they, when I got talking to them when I was st still at Toyota, they, they uh, talked to me about, well, we want to do something different. We want to have a different structure, organization structure. We like to have a more systematic approach, and it really sounded more like what the Japanese do. And I thought uh, that that'd be an interesting challenge, being in, that I was a, with the U.S. company and the Japanese company, and now a German company. So, organization structure was very, very important for us to make it flat, with a picture of in the end being a very, very efficient organization company. So, flat structure, which was different again from the traditional, and very team oriented. Um, and that set different roles, and that as you see in that, sh that chart, and responsibilities. An example of that, an engineer at Ford, or even at Toyota, well, maybe not so much at Toyota, but at Ford, in those traditional environments, not, and they've changed too, I don't want to bash anybody, but th they would have a, a very, very different role than what I saw or what we saw in a, in a team environment. In a team environment, an engineer is a teacher. Their job is really to pass on knowledge, skill sets, and help others solve problems that in that traditional world typically they would do. And if you couldn't do that, if you, couldn't have those, if you didn't have those communication skills, the ability to transfer that information, you just didn't get hired. You didn't fit into that team. That's just one example, but we reset roles and responsibilities throughout the organization. Direction and plan, and this feeds back into what you're all talking about too. We, when we started, before, when we were doing site prep, five-year window revolving, always keeping a five-year window of time in front of us with a one-year action plan. Now, now, in economic development, what does that boil down to? For me, I have been only six years in this industry, but I have seen so many strategic plans that, that, that are this thick and there's that much dust on top of them. And... Um, <coughs> And people pay for these plans. And what they, I mean, you have to have that, okay? You have to have that. It's no question. You have to have that vision. Where are we going and so on. But a one-year action plan. So how do you take that five years and move it into a prioritization? What are you going to do in year one? What needs to be done in year one? And by the way, you need to capture all those years because everybody thinks, and I heard a little bit about that this morning too, everybody thinks everything should happen the first year. But if they don't see it on paper, okay, uh, if they don't see it on paper, then they think you're not listening to them. And Sharon's captured a number of things on paper for that very reason. So capturing it on paper, and you can move it around. So our initial five-year plan, some of the things that we planned in year two move to year three. Some of the things we planned in year four move to year two. It, it moves around. And that's okay. It, it's, but you have to have a starting point. So there's no perfect plan is, is the message there. But you have to have some type of a roadmap. 
challenging targets. I, I like to say, I want to stretch my organization. And then people start getting nervous. They say, well, it's an elastic band. It may break. Well, you may have to manage that. But you really want to stretch people because what you'll find is they will do a lot more than you ever thought they could. And they will love it. And they'll own it. And, and, and it just builds on itself. So we wanted, that was different than Stuttgart, that picture in Stuttgart. So we wanted not just this engaged or participative management, all those buzzwords. We didn't want that. We wanted something real that you know, we could really touch and feel every day. Measurable actions. And that plan, if you can't measure it, don't do it. It's just that simple. And so the challenge is how do you figure out how to measure it? And, um, and, and that is absolutely critical. Follow-up checkpoints. Weakest point in management, typically, is follow-up. A follow-up is really important because it gives you an opportunity not just to see where you're at, but to thank people, to celebrate, to see where resources may be needed that are not in play, to bring others in. It's that team building process. So it's a great opportunity, but it takes time. And sometimes management of uh, plans, people say, well, we really don't have enough time for that. Well, then shrink the number of items you're working on because if you don't follow up, believe me, He's not going to get far down the road. And then countermeasures. I mentioned earlier, problems are opportunities. Those are countermeasures if they're small. So catching them early, so lots of follow-up. Sometimes people say to me, you're micromanaging these topics. And I say, maybe I am, but they need to be micromanaged. You couldn't micromanage everything, but there are certain things that need to be managed on a daily basis. The next item was a systematic approach. Claire referred to this production system. There was no production system as with the Toyota, with the Toyota production system famous globally. We wrote a production system for the company. A very systematic structured approach on safety, training, quality, right all the way to continuous improvement. So the pillars that supported, actually <laughs> the implementation of those pillars supported the startup of the plant. So, um, but it gave us a Bible, if you like, 100 pages. I told my team when we wrote, I said, it can't be more than 100 pages. It's 99 pages. And it's basic. <laughs> but it's just basic, you know. But if you don't give targets like that, you end up with, when I left Mercedes, they gave me a Bible. And I'm, it looks like a Bible. All the, all the processes, all the documentation that we created over the years, and it is a Bible. But, it, but it, it, within that, there's the 99 pages also of the production system. So a production system that people could see themselves in and that you could see those roles and that communication, which was critical in everything that we did, uh, allowing the team to know where, how they were doing. Because in a startup, people are always, how am I doing, boss? How am I doing, boss? You can't be you know, answering, at that time, it was 1,500 people. You can't be answering everybody every day, so how do you make it visual so people understand the norm and abnormal situations? Transparency is my point. Think about that with your plans. How transparent can you make your plans to the community? And how important is that? And, and how important is it to talk about things that are, we're struggling with that we need some more additional support on? Um, organization development, the, the how we hired people, a very, very systematic approach because we wanted people who could operate in a team, a very, 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 very structured team. So what happened as a result of Mercedes-Benz? Now, this is a statewide picture of uh, what happened in 1993. Nobody built cars in Alabama. We had a most interesting site. I mean, I, when I first went to the site, I said, we could ski. If there was snow in Alabama, we could ski down some of these hills. So the site prep took a fair length of time. Um, but So we started building cars in, in um, February of 1997. So from 1997, Mercedes, Start off with, we said that the, in, in the announcement back in September of 93, we'd have approximately 1,500 team members. And uh, this is how we, this is how it's evolved. So that's the, that's the Mercedes picture. And uh, those other dots, just, you know, just, uh, the other dots are suppliers, okay? Tier one suppliers. Then Honda came along. 
And they visited us, and they said, why are you here, and all those discussions. And then they decided, well, we, should, we were on the west side of Birmingham. They said, well, we should build on the east side of Birmingham. So Honda came along, and the supplier base grew. Next, please. Okay, and, and, uh, and then we have Hyundai came along, and they also came and visited us, and why'd you come to Alabama? <laughs> same, same talk. And, uh, and they've located with uh, some 3,000 people, and uh, as you can see with Honda, there's 4,000 direct. These are direct, okay? And then we have an engine plant that, that came along in Huntsville, Alabama, and the, the Toyota, and uh, they built four-cylinder, six-cylinder, eight-cylinder engines in that plant. Every one of those operations has expanded. Mercedes-Benz is an example. We started off, we said we were going to have a $300 million investment, and we would have 1.2 million square feet. Before we broke ground, we decided we needed a, a additional capacity, went to 400 million. Um, before I left in 2001, we put, uh, we put together a $600 million expansion, and that brought us from 1,500 up to 3,000. Today, today, that was 5 million square feet under roof, $5 billion U.S. dollars in investment in the ground on that 936-acre piece of property on Interstate 2059. And, um, and the suppliers, look at the total number of suppliers we have now. <clears throat> that's, and that's tier one, okay? And, and, and now, an interesting picture is statewide, and it really paints a picture of global, too, the impact of a company and what it has. Now, imagine that picture if we had different colored dots with tier two and tier three. And that's what we're working on now. We're really focused on lead generation, we're calling it, making trips to Europe, in particular because between Mercedes, Volkswagen, and BMW, there's a million plus vehicles a year there alone. In the state of Alabama, from 1997 to now, zero to one, a little over a million vehicles a year now in the state of Alabama. In the southeast, look at that picture, you can see that over again in South Carolina, you can see that in Mississippi, in Tennessee and in neighboring states. So there's a lot of growth going on. So you have to take a look at tier two and tier three and understand that they supply not just that Mercedes or BMW or Volkswagen, they supply multiple brands. So we, th this is a marketing tool we take with us to Europe. But the marketing tool is a picture not just of Alabama, it's the Southeast. Because we wanna show them the whole. So they see the opportunities. Of course we'd like to have them come to Alabama, but that bigger picture is a much better picture when it comes to making a decision to uh, come to Alabama. So, shift gears a little bit. Investment ready, and, and how does Alabama do it? Well, there's a lot to be said about product. And product is sites and buildings, okay? Now, I'm, I'm gonna give you a little story that's a true story. There's an area called C3 in, in uh, West Alabama. It's three communities that have come together with a, a number of mayors and elected officials. And to their credit, they've been together for about four years. And we work with them, on, and I'll, I'll ex explain that a little on a picture in, in a few minutes, but we worked with them on creating a plan and deploying that plan. But in one of our early meetings, they, where they wanted to show us the uh, properties that they had sites. <clears throat> so we went and looked at the sites. And on this two-lane highway, on one side of the road, on the east side, there was a nice piece of property, nice, you know, well done up, infrastructure and so on. It was probably about 50 acres, 50, 60 acres. The other, right across the road, there was another sign with an identical site, about the same size site. And, but on the west side, there was a mayor, and on the east side, there was a different mayor. Now, we're in a meeting and, and they're, they're going on and on. We're trying to get them this regional picture in their minds. And I said, I finally I stopped them and I said, listen, I said, folks, I'm going to put my business hat back on and here's the deal. I, I'm, a, I'm a prospect. I got this company and I want to come here. I need to come here. I love the site on the east and the site on the west. I mean, it's similar, but I'm not coming here. 
And the reason why I'm not coming here is because if I cho chose the east side, I'm going to anger this mayor over here and vice versa. And I just don't want to live in that type of community. So the message is, like I said, which one are you going to market? Not two, which one? And that's difficult for a mayor because they're saying, hey, well, if, you know, Joe gets it and I don't get it, then I may lose the next election, you know, and people are going to say, well, how come we didn't get it? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's competitive, that competitive, you know, obviously global, but even right down into communities. And you have to, I, you have to give the mayors the, the respect on this issue because it's a difficult question to answer to somebody phoning all the time. We get phone calls from legislators and senators because you know, we'll land a project. And they'll say, well, how come we didn't get it? You know, and, and it's unbelievable because you don't have the product. I mean, look, look where they landed you. <laughs> look where you are. You know, spend some money on, on your infrastructure, spend some money on a site development, buildings and so on, because as I mentioned earlier, those 400 odd sites and 400 odd buildings are not all ready. And there's not enough money to keep doing this. So pick your building, pick your site, and pick your sector, and go to work. So <clears throat> the right product, targeted sectors. And I'll explain our sectors to the state of Alabama, but in economic development, what I found, not just they're cats and it's hard to herd them, but they run after everything and anything. Anything that moves, okay? And when I first saw this, I, I mean, that, that is unbelievable because you may land some things you really don't want that don't fit. So, you know, so what, what fits? We had, and that's taken us years to get them into this plan I'm going to talk about, but targeted sectors that fit and complement your community across multiple topics, and I'll talk about that in some detail. Finance, financial assistance, incentives, training dollars. Put your dollars in the incentive area related to training, workforce development. It's your money coming back. You're developing people in the community. That's you know, that $600 million expansion, $100 million we took from the state, Governor Siegelman at the time. I sat down with him in my house because it was a very hush-hush project. I said, Governor, I need 100 mil to, to make this project work because we had Chrysler at the time and they were competing for that same product line. And, um, and I said, but I want it all earmarked 100% for training. And we will spend that and then some. Of course, you know, the site prep and you know those statutory items came along but that incentive money it was all 100% earmarked to, for workforce development because quite frankly speaking we spent a m <laughs> we spent much more than that I mean that's an ongoing everyday topic is it not but that's a good opportunity to start aligning your education system because you got some dollars to work with right and education you need a carrot okay so targeted sectors capable workforce in the U.S. and in Canada, and it's talked a little bit about skilled trades, workforce is a topic, and it is a major topic, folks. And um, we, we have not been training people in the skill sets that are needed for manufacturing-type jobs, and others too, but manufacturing in particular. Um, I recently <coughs> visited Windsor because we've been looking at tool and die shops because we need them down there. So we've been visiting companies. I was shocked recently, it's about a year and a half ago now, but I was shocked when I talked to the uh, owners of these companies in Windsor, Ontario. They said they can't get people because the two-year system, the trade schools, are not trade schools any longer. They don't teach those skill sets. And why they don't is because the last year, they, one individual told us the last year that they had, well, after the course, they had six people enroll. So the you know, same problem in Canada that the US, U.S. has, and that is that workforce development. If we want to continue to manufacture, make things in this advanced manufacturing world, which is not very well understood either. Um, advanced manufacturing for me, just to give you an example, a maintenance person in robotic cells, as I'm talking, a maintenance person now needs to have a four-year degree because they have to be able to program robotic cells. In the Mercedes plant in Alabama, in the body shop alone, there's 1,100 and counting robotic cells. That's you know, just the body shop. You look at Honda, you'll see the same, and Hyundai the same, and so on. But, and uh, so the, the application of robotics is alive and well, growing, 
But folks, it's not the robot, you know, the thing that makes all those moves. It's the head, what's on the end of the robot. That's the technology, and that's the change. So now the streams of workforce development, when we went there in 93, we said we want folks that have a grade 12 education. That'll do, okay? Because we, we started off real basic 20-odd robots. Because nobody, there wasn't, a, there were no robotic cells in Alabama. So we knew we were going to have to grow. <laughs> and um, so the, that training process, you know, it took a lot of years, but that is not the case today, as I said, with those, with the robotic cells of volume that we have now, you, you have to have that input coming out of the education system. So the streams look not just 12 year, or grade 12 rather grad, there's a stream out of grade 12, sure, it's always going to be there. There's an additional stream out of two year system that's growing immensely, and there's a, a growing stream out of the four year system. So there's three streams of workforce development that are needed in today's advanced, so-called advanced manufacturing world. A plan that brings people together. So let's just go to the next one, because the, the people coming together, for me, can we go to one more, is this regional topic. So, so taking a look at the region, then we drew this map. This is a map that we draw in Alabama. It's a 60-mile radius. We go into a community, work with a community, because in Alabama, people will drive 60 miles one way for a good job. And uh, we were shocked. We, you know, Mercedes, we thought people would move into the Tuscaloosa areas, which is relatively close to the plant. Didn't happen. They stayed in their towns. And they drove some 75 miles in, in some cases. So what's that 60-mile radius look like? And what's inside that 60-mile radius? And what can you build off of when you're looking at recruitment, retention, and renewal? And, uh, and who should be present? Who, who are your parties? And I know you've got four mayors working closely together, but it, you know, it's, it's, more than, it's more than the picture you've got today is my, my suggestion. But it's a, a great starting point, okay? So we draw this 60-mile radius so people start understanding anything that happens in that 60 miles is going to have an impact on you, uh, positive or negative. It's going to impact your community. Understand that. Start stepping back. It's a global world, folks. And this is only 60 miles, okay? So it's still a pretty small picture. So once we, once we do, once we've been through that, we, we start talking about the team, okay? And, and, and you've got a lot of your team in place. Um, you've got a couple missing players, okay? And the private sector's at the table. Um, you're, Community leaders are at the table. I don't see your two-year, four-year at the table. Maybe they are, but it's in K-12 and what we call career tech ed, the technical courses in that high school, which are, have, we've gone this way, we need to start bringing them back more, so. And uh, economic development, government, of course. And, but what's that team look like? And there's always a question mark off to the side on who's missing because, you know, it's 60 mile radius. And, and I'll give you an example. When we, when we talk about auto in, in Alabama, I'm always at the table because of my background. We talk about aerospace as a different person at the table and so on, but it's by sectors. And uh, we work with agendas, very structured meetings. Again, it goes back to like Rory. We, 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 we like to have structure, okay? And we like to have report outs so, that so it's transparent so people can see when I'm in trouble and what they need to do to help me move my topic. So it's team sport. And we use flip charts to capture things so that we're focused, we understand where we're, what we're going to be working on in the next meeting. We try to make it as transparent as possible. But this picture, folks, going back to that Mercedes deal, they didn't have a picture look like that, but they functioned like that. That's why we showed up. That, that's why we ended up there. That team approach where everybody's aligned, they're focused, know what needs to be done, understand their roles, and um, know what they know what's expected out of them, and know what's expected when they do their debrief. Because also, and this is something the economic developers are not very good at, not in Alabama at least, debriefing. Oh, we want it or we didn't. Why didn't we? That's a great discussion, folks. I learned a lot more from mistakes than I ever learned from successes. 
So now, as a state agency, we'll go to the next one. <laughs> when, when Governor Bentley went into office four and a half years ago, he called me up. He was governor elect at the time, in fact, and he said, "You know, I've been wandering around the state as I was <laughs> campaigning." I met all these economic developers, and he said, there's a lot of them out there. I said, yeah. He said, but he said, what are they doing? He said, is there a plan that they work to or that you know, the state may uh, have? And I said, I don't think so. I've never seen one. He said, well, would you develop a, a strategic, he called it a strategic plan, but you know what, you know where I am on that. I won't go back over that. But he said, well, you create a plan for the state. So we got together as a group, and we create a plan of, for recruitment, retention, and renewal. And, and recruitment's pretty obvious, retention's pretty obvious. We want a different word for this innovation and you know, what's missing and you know, the, that next economy. And the word that came up in, in my mind, at least when we had hashed around, was every company that's successful renews themselves every day. It, it never stops. You call it continuous improvement, Kaizen, call it whatever you like. But if you're not renewing yourself you know, and getting better at what you do, um, you're not gonna be around for the long haul. So we created that plan in which the state, the Commerce Department, leads recruitment. The retention is led by K-12, Career Tech Ed, and, four, and the two-year system, rather. And, I, and, I, and the four-year system leads the renewal component. So we now have education at the table at the state level. So we have chancellors and um, presidents and, and of education and at the table for the first time ever. Now, why did we do that? Well, another thing that struck me as quite peculiar when I w started this process uh, was that, you know, we, we go out and we find a company and we land the company, work like crazy, land the company, and then they show up and then we say to education, oh, by the way, we need these skill sets. And education just doesn't <laughs> work like that. So, so guess what? The gap get, keeps getting larger and larger. So, so I thought to myself, okay, if we get them at the table, at least they'll get the information. You know, that's better than what we've got now. And hopefully it'll evolve into some, some targeted um, training programs, which it has to their credit. And to their credit, some four years later, they still meet. We meet on a quarterly basis. And, um, and we talk about things that are working and things that are not working. Is it perfect? No. It's a starting point. I mean, it's a process, folks. I mean, I, there's no perfect picture that I've ever seen. So it's a process, and we're somewhere down that road. The sectors, we've identified 11 sectors that we target that fit in the state of Alabama. But we ask communities to, back to that picture of the team, to take one or two or three of those sectors, no more than three, that would fit into your community and align education your um, property, your, your sites, buildings, and so on, to fit those sectors. Not a broad brush, not the shotgun approach, but a much more targeted approach to economic development. And, um, and that's, uh, but if you don't have that footprint at the state level, I don't know what a community can do other than try to figure it out on their own. And, and honestly speaking, that's, that's not, that's not, that's not going to be very effective. So, I'm keeping to my time frame pretty good. So we look at action plans, and I just want to emphasize that you have to look at short-term, middle-term, and long-term. So we're in these communities, and we, these, this group of people around the table, we talk about what are you going to do in recruitment, what are you going to do in retention, what are you going to do in renewal in the one-year time frame, two- to three-year time frame, five-year. And we build those off flip charts with the community and then we get put the ownership that's similar, it's a mirror of what we do at the state level. Because one of the things I recognize is that the state doing something, it will get, sure, we'll get some progress. But if, the, if you're doing a top down and bottom up, it's probably a little more accountability that's going to be associated with that overall plan. So it helps that check and balance a little bit. And again, I mentioned the uh, measurable actions and follow up and, and learn through the experiences, I, I want to again say, make your plans transparent. Uh, in these communities, I say, get your plan, get a, a war room, I would call it, get a room where your plans are plastered up on the wall that anybody can walk in and take a look at how the community's doing, what you're working on, and, um, and how you're making out. 
in one community we worked with, just a short story, <clears throat> I'm not going to name the community, but the mayor said to me, he said, you know, we can't get people to uh, even come here. They may drive through, but they're not stopping because of litter. He said, it's just, uh, he said, it's just a real, real problem. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, well, Mayor, why don't you, uh, what, what, you know, get your police force together, and I said, and make littering like a $500 fine. He looked at me, I said, you got to put some teeth in it. And he said, well, I can't do that. He said, these people can't. Said, it's, it, this is in rural Alabama. He said, these people can't afford $500. I said, I understand that, but look at the litter crew you just created. And then, you know, they start picking up litter to pay off the $500. They're going to understand why you don't litter, right? But, I mean, how do you, you know, you, you got to have the courage to go out there and say, this is going to end. And if it doesn't, there'll be a consequence. And uh, he, he didn't do that, by the way. Um, but uh, he, he did take some action in the churches, and it did, it, it did make a difference. It, it's not perfect again, but it did make a difference. But it motivated him. You know, sometimes you throw stuff on the table like that just to get the wheels turning. Okay? Maybe that wasn't doable for a lot of good reasons. You know, but, but it got the wheels turning, and, and they did make some headway. So last chart. You know, Alabama's football, right? So I always have to use the analogy of football um, with, uh, with when I'm in Alabama and, and talking to folks in Alabama because they get that. Okay, they, they get that winning. What they don't get, though, because like, we have Friday night football for high schools. And town to town, I mean, it, it's competitive. And then Saturdays we have college football, same thing. Okay? But what they don't see is that those teams practice a lot before Friday night and or Saturday. And they have their game plans set up, and they get to know each other, they understand the strengths and weaknesses of everybody, who's gonna do what, what roles they're playing, and, and, and. and they practice that over and over and over again. And uh, they get real good at it, and they win championships like Alabama does quite often. Um, my point here, folks, is I under, you know, monthly meetings are good, but how many times can you meet to practice, to be able to Say what's on your mind, you know, get those problems on the table and talk about them when they're this big and, uh, and then figure out what are we going to do. And there's no perfect solution. Um, my strength in business always was that I could find some course or direction or some crazy comment like $500 fine to get the ball or keep the ball moving. Somebody else would come up with a better idea, but somebody has to have that role to, uh, to uh, motivate people and challenge them to, um, to answer the, um, what's needed to be answered. Now, the very last thing I'm going to say, motivation is so, so, so important. And it's like a Mercedes high powerful engine burns a lot of fuel, high, high octane fuel. Uh, you gotta keep fuel in the tank. Now, how do you do that? By celebrating successes, small, medium, large, but small successes. Every time you can do that, you're going to put something back in the tank and that'll charge up that engine. And that, that's so, so important. So pat yourself on the back with your accomplishments. Learn from, you know, things that worked, didn't work rather, and, and things that worked. And you'll go a long way down the road. And I, I finally, I want to applaud you for your efforts in coming together and challenge you to continue to come together like this and figure out what your role is, what is your contribution on an individual basis to bettering your community. Thank you very much.